Good afternoon, and welcome to MBF Biosciences' latest webinar on C. elegans imaging and behavioral analysis with WormLab 3.0. My name is Peter Lang. As product manager for WormLab, I'm responsible for facilitating communication between Worm researchers and our software development team here as part of a continuous improvement process for WormLab. Hi, I'm Jeff Sprenger. I'm Vice President of Research and Development, and I'm responsible for the oversight of the development of WormLab. So let's go over some of the goals for today's webinar. We are going to uh, show you the MBF Biosciences WormLab video capture system in action with a detailed look at its key design features. You will learn how to easily use the system to generate high quality videos optimized for worm tracking. We'll also demonstrate the capabilities and new features of our recently released Worm Layer 3.0 and learn how to use the integrated video capture tools, automatically detect and track C. elegans worms, and then quantify the worm morphology and behavioral analysis. After each major topic, we'll pause for questions. Feel free to submit questions at any time via the, the questions window. If you have additional questions that are not addressed by the conclusion of the presentation, just email us your questions at info at mbfbioscience.com and we'll respond to you directly. So let's take a quick look now at a general overview of the Worm Lab system. Worm Lab 2.0. Has been out on the market for a while, and we released a 3.0 version of Worm Lab last fall. Um, 3.0 has the same workflow approach that we had in the prior version, uh, and today what we're going to be showing you is uh, the capturing of video using our Worm Lab video capture system. We'll give you a live demo of selecting worms from that captured video, tracking those worms, and showing you the new features in our analysis and visualization and then also um, show you that you can export your data from Worm Lab um, out to data files that can be read by either Excel or MATLAB. We initially released Worm Lab about two years ago, and our development team, through close collaboration with uh, the Worm research community, I, I think really hit their mark offering an intuitive, easy to use worm tracking software package. But that was really only half of the, the solution our customers required. We found that customers really needed an affordable imaging system that would produce high quality video sequences over a wide range of zoom levels. A tool that would really enable them to, to track either individual worms or perform whole plate imaging. So MBF Bioscience engineers really tackled that problem head on and they designed a very flexible video capture system. I'm gonna take a look, closer look at that system right now. And Jeff, maybe you can help me out here. With yeah, the yeah, I, I, I'm gonna, uh, I'll, I'll hold the webcam. We're gonna move the webcam over to the, um, the video capture system. Now, one thing that you may want to take a look at is on your screen right now, uh, there's a double bar that will allow you to potentially uh, slide it across the screen so you can increase the size of the webcam window so you can uh, take a closer look at some of these elements here. Uh, so let's start with a, uh, just describing a, a brief overview of the system in general here. It's made of three sub-assemblies, namely the camera stand itself, the uh, high resolution CCD and macro lens, as well as the macro illuminator. And we'll go into each one. Uh, the primary design considerations for the base and the camera stand is jitter-free reco recording of your video sequences. So here we have a base, uh, solid aluminum base with an optical breadboard layout, M6 tapped holes. And there it's actually suitable for mounting any other type of external apparatus uh, for your applications. The vertical camera post right here provides a stable mount for jitter-free recording. The, uh, the post itself is a one and a half by three inch aluminum extrusion, so it's a very solid piece. Uh, on the post itself, we have a uh, measuring scale, which allows you to quickly repeat a specific mechanical setup to reproduce previous assays. At the top of the post, we have a cable management system that neatly routes all the cables out of the way uh, as you adjust the zoom level of the camera. 
That brings me to my next point, which is the other design consideration for the camera stand, namely adjustability. We have the fast glide adjustment feature here. We just simply loosen the knob at the rear of the uh, adjustment, fast glide adjustment, and we can slide the camera at various levels and then lock it right into place. We also have a fine focus adjust on the camera mount here, so you can precisely focus uh, the worms with ease. There are other types of focus me mechanisms here built into the lens uh, of the macro lens itself, and we'll discuss that next. So here we have the, uh, this happens to be an AVT, uh, high resolution CCD camera. Uh, we chose CCD cameras over the CMOS CMOS uh, counterparts, primarily because the CMOS CCD sensor provides a cleaner image uh, because it's inherently less noisy. Plus, the CCD sensors also have uh, better low light sensitivity. The Nikkor 60 millimeter uh, macro lens has a uh, close range correction system built into it so that as we adjust the camera up and down on the on the vertical post here we're always able to achieve optimal resolution due to the design of that particular lens so that's going to bring us to our last component of the uh, camera setup here and that is the macro illuminator the macro illuminator the challenge here really was generating even illumination across a large field of view and developing a high contrast image. One of the major advantages of uh, using C. elegans in research is their transparency. Unfortunately, that also kind of presents a problem for machine vision applications. So we designed an illumination system that's gonna create solid, dark, high contrast images of the normally transparent worms. Uh, so the light path starts right here with the uh, LED module and uh, the housing design itself has an integral cooling fan, which accounts for thermal management of the LED itself, as well as avoids coupling heat back to the specimen. The diffuser element mitigates hot spots within the 50 millimeter field of view, creating a flat field background. Light then passes through a series of optical elements, evenly illuminating the specimen on the top surface of the illuminator, which is where we place the uh, the specimen dish. And uh, the key here is really to uh, produce a collimated light path, and that's going to produce the high contrast image of that normally transparent worm. Uh, on the right side here, we have an adjustment knob for the illuminator, which changes the incident angle of illumination, and it further increases the image contrast compared to a standard bright field illumination system. So each component in this worm lab video capture system was really carefully chosen to produce an optimized imaging solution specifically for worm tracking. That's unlike your typical compound microscope or stereo microscope. We have the capability here to go from a field of view of eight millimeters to 50 millimeters and be able to track individual worms or whole plate tracking with a single setup. So this is really something different than what you find uh, in your typical microscope design or even stereoscope design. So we're going to pause here for any questions that m you may have uh, on the hardware setup itself. All right, so we have a question in here. Uh, how is it going to work if someone wants to use vibrations to analyze escape response? The idea behind the stand itself is to provide a stable platform. However, the, uh, the dish itself is not necessarily uh, locked down in, into position. So if you were to uh, present some type of external vibration uh, to the dish itself, that could still be utilized as a uh, as a stimulus. Yeah. So so what some of um, our customers are doing. One example is a tap habituation, where you're providing a stimulus uh, as a single tap and then looking at the reversals of the worms. So you can mount a um, a solenoid um, to the top of this. We can also change out the top base plate if you need to, so that you can mount hardware to that. Um, if you want to mount a vibration source, and that's something else that you can talk to us about. 
there, there's another question uh, that just came in. Does it work if we use uh, fluorescence illuminator? Um, this example that you're seeing here is a white LED. And uh, we are working in R&D right now on a fluorescence um, illumination source for this uh, that will require additional filters to filter out uh, both excitation and emission spectrum. So that is something we're working on, but what you're seeing right here is a white light illuminator. And that was one of the design considerations, actually, when we uh, went forward with the uh, macro illuminator design. It's actually a modular setup. So the... Uh, the current white LED source module can be easily removed, and our plans are actually to be able to uh, attach a fluorescence unit uh, directly at that location. Okay, so we're going to um, we're going to move on to the next part of this. We're going to actually run a demonstration of um, Worm Lab using the hardware setup here. So what you're going to be seeing is um, the live video coming from the camera, and we'll show you how we capture videos. Uh, and how we basically um, run Worm Lab with the hardware setup. So uh, a couple of slides back, uh, I talked a little bit about a system overview, but I think it's really helpful to see this. Um, if uh, let me just walk through the application really quickly for people that are not familiar with Worm Lab, uh, the way it works is on the left here we have a workflow that walks you through from uh, loading videos either from the camera directly or uh, from from your uh, from your hard drive or over the network, and then uh, providing some information about scaling, adjusting um, the image processing parameters. Um, that's in this step of dust image, detecting and tracking, and then finally the analysis of the data. So in Worm Lab 3.0, um, some of the things that are fairly uh, new and advanced are uh, the video capture has been improved. Uh, we'll show you some of the new features there. Um, we have changed the uh, image adjustment to make it a little bit easier to see uh, the thresholding, and I'll give you an example of that and point that out. Uh, detecting and tracking, we've added, and I'll show you this in, a, in the demonstration a little later, we've added a swimming worm model. So I'll show you that um, we can track both uh, crawling and swimming worms. And uh, finally, the analysis has gone over, had a, a large overhaul where we've added uh, a graphic visualization and we've added um, some more new analyses. So I'm going to walk you through uh, those as well. So what Peter's going to do right now is um, I'm going to turn on the, uh, the camera. And, and here, why don't you wave your hand under there so we know that, uh, yeah, that's Ooh. really that's a live <laughs> image that you're seeing. Um, so this is the video capture image that we have right now. I'm going to enlarge this a little bit. Um, I can roll my mouse wheel in and out to do sort of a digital zoom, if you like. And uh, if I zoom in quite close, Peter can then adjust the fine focus and determine uh, if, if he has uh, the best or optimal focus. That's looking pretty good right there. So this is a, a, a you know, a plate of worms, and uh, why don't you tell them a little about where the, the worms uh, are coming from? Well, these worms were uh, provided by Dr. Randy Blakely at Vanderbilt University. Uh, we worked. We have worked closely with his lab. Uh, he's actually a current user of the Worm Lab video capture system uh, as well, and uh, he was kind enough to provide us with those worms today. Right. So they they FedEx the worms to us um, overnight, and uh, I think they arrived yesterday. And then um, we moved them from food to clean plates uh, here. And uh, so you're seeing these these worms that were, I guess they were plated um, two days ago, right? And, right. But they're running on clean plates, so. Um, what, you, what you'll notice right now is that uh, you can see at the boundaries, you can see the, the edge of the dish. So um, we have the camera adjusted about two thirds of the way up. So if we pull um, that back all the way, we, we'll not only cover the whole dish, but we'll actually cover um, outside of that, um, the actual work surface of the, uh, the illuminator. So we're sort of gonna go with uh, this resolution. I'm gonna walk you over through the, the video capture. Um, First thing you can do is you can actually um, display a grid. Um, the reason for that is that before putting the plate down, we'd normally put a calibration uh, film over that, and that would allow us to capture sort of the scaling, which we'd use when we were setting up our image information. And the grid allows you to line um, that scale with sort of the, the frame of the video. Then we have this other thing here called display clipping. This is new. Uh, if you click on this, and then you move over and adjust um, let's say your exposure and you start uh, increasing your exposure time, you see this big red flare 
uh, going on. Well, those are saturated pixels, and that's something that you want to stay away from. So uh, in this example, what I do is I reduce my exposure until the red goes away. And then I know that um, I'm not running into clipping, so I'll get better image processing results. Um, you know, Peter mentioned this before, that the reason that we developed this system and the software together was that we, we noticed that our customers were having a real challenge trying to capture good quality videos and they were turning to us and asking, well, you know, what do I need to know? What kind of camera do I need? Uh, what, how do I do like even illumination? How do I get rid of that hot spot in the middle and that sort of thing? So that's really been, what's been driving the design of this software is making the acquisition of video and then the tracking of worms uh, as simple as possible, you know, so sort of eliminate the frustration. Right. So um, what you'll see here too, in, in video mode, I'm in format seven. There's uh, several options here for this camera. You can go to sort of a lower resolution mode. Uh, if I switch to something like 800 by 600, you can see that you're only capturing part of that plate. And so what's happening is you're only using part of the sensor. When you go onto format seven, that's sort of like custom mode. And then when you do that, you can actually choose uh, the resolution of the image. So here we're at uh, 2400 by 2K. So we're running at about a five megapixel resolution right here on the CCD uh, camera. I'll apply that and I'm, I'm sort of back to where I was. Um, you can adjust your exposure here. This is something we improved in Worm Lab. It's much easier to sort of get this exposure to move up and down um, and uh, just to, by clicking up and down, or you can actually set your exact exposure time. You can change the gain in brightness. We really don't need to do that here. Um, if we skip back over to the capture tab, the folder here, this is where the video, videos will be captured to. We're putting them in a desktop videos folder. And um, what we'll do, we can type in a name here and then it'll use this as a prefix for the name and then it'll add on uh, sort of the numbers 001, 002, uh, and so on for as many videos as that you capture. Um, something new in this version is the duration and, and uh, time lapse. You can specify now that you only want to capture a certain length video. So when you click that start button, you'll get at exactly a 10 second capture. So what we'll do here, um, we'll capture this video. I'll do a record. And you'll see up here, it now says it's recording. And this is the time elapsed. We're at like four or five seconds. Um, it gives you a frame count. And we see it's running a frame rate of about nine frames a second, which is typical for a large frame like um, this uh, five megapixel. Now, if you drop the frame size down, you'll get faster frame rates. So I don't know if you've noticed this, but if you look in the background, after the video finished recording, it loaded automatically into Worm Lab. So let me close the video. And now what we're doing here, as you can see, um, we sort of have this large scrolling field of view. If you want, you center your mouse in the middle and roll backwards. That's zooming out. And you'll see that what we've done with this system is that we have a fairly flat field of view, but there's still a gradient that's going to the outer edge. Um, we have tried to get this light as flat as we can. And in instances when it's not as flat as you want, we can go ahead and adjust the image. Now you'll see that I have threshold here at the top. Let me just turn that threshold down for a second. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on this hotspot illumination correction. So now I want you to watch this. It's very bright in the middle and it fades off to the end. Now I'm going to apply this hotspot correction and your eyes almost play a trick on you. You'll see that the whole video field is now flat. So what we did here is we developed a method where without, you know, whether worms are on the plate or not, we model sort of that background gradient and then we perform a subtraction or a division of the data. In other words, what we do is we compensate for that um, gradient. And the reason that you want to do that is because we, you're using, we're using thresholding to separate the worms from the background, you're going to want a very even illumination. And the, uh, the hotspot correction is very, very fast. So while we do the tracking, it's doing hotspot correction all along the way. Now we adjust this threshold level here, right? And you'll see, as I zoom in, that the worms have turned green. So what we do, you can turn the highlight on and off, all right? And you'll see that that's, that's showing you where uh, the threshold has put the foreground. So this is, this is a pretty good example of um, you know, how you do the, the, the light correction on a plate. And you can apply this to your, um, your own videos. So whether they're coming from the, this video capture system or you've already captured the videos and you have this hotspot problem, you can use this correction to compensate. All right, Peter is going to, we're going to go back to live video and uh, Peter is going to um, now take the, uh, the video uh, camera 
and he's going to slide it down. And so we're now we're now sort of changing modes here, where we want to show you the range. Now we're coming into sort of the the close up, if you like. And we'll just adjust first adjust this with a uh, coarse focus on the lens. And that, that looks really good. So what I'm going to do over here in settings is I'm going to actually increase our exposure a little bit because it looks fairly dark. And I'll bring that up like that. So as you can see, it's very easy to go from a whole plate imaging mode to imaging a much smaller area, just a few worms, without much, uh, yeah. much so time. So we'll, we'll move the plate around a bit. Oh, there's, these, guys are, these guys are moving. So here, let's go back and do this real quick. I'll do a record. I'm doing like still doing that uh, 10 second duration and we're just about done okay and then we're back in live view and you can start seeing the tracks here but that doesn't really matter um, now I recorded this at a quite a high resolution okay in other words it's still the 5 megapixel but you don't really need to do that let's go back now what I can do is I can now drop the frame rate down, something like 800 by 600. So what you notice right away is that the worms really seem to be uh, much larger, like I, I got in closer. Well, that's not what happened. I'm just using now the center of the chip, the 800 by 600. So you still have the same um, resolution of the sensing, but you're working with a smaller video frame, which might be appropriate. So if you want to move those around, we'll, we'll see if we can capture um, Okay, yeah, he's sliding the plate around a bit. Okay, sure, that's good right there. Okay, I move it over a little bit. I'm going to try and capture him before he moves out of the frame. Okay, good. Hmm. All right, so we'll just now we record got two. this. And maybe we'll get an interaction here. Yeah. They only have three seconds left to interact before the duration <laughs> stops. <laughs> <laughs> well, we could try another record. Yeah. Okay, we're okay. We got them. Yeah, we got an interaction. Great, they're coming together. Now back again. Okay, so let me close this. So you'll notice these tabs here: um, demo 002, 003. So this was the first one when the, the worms were coming together. This is the second one with an interaction. I'll, I'll walk you through a little bit of the workflow. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to set the scaling. Now normally you're going to do this with a, uh, a, scaling, um, a scaling film that I mentioned before. So what we'll do here is we'll measure, a, if we had a scale bar down here, we'd measure and say that was something like one millimeter or a thousand uh, microns. So I've done that. That sets the scaling so that all of our analysis will show sort of correct lengths and so on. Uh, we come here and we adjust the threshold like this. And then under detection, um, we don't need to apply any hotspot here. This is fairly f even field illumination. And so under detection, we'll just click on, say, this worm and that worm. And then um, we'll turn off our width fitting. I'll go over here to the tracking tab. So I'm sort of working on the right-hand side. Uh, I want crawling worms. Uh, I want backtracking because they're going to interact. Um, we can choose how many frames we want to um, analyze the interaction for. I'll put something like 100 frames here and then uh, start. Okay, so we just track these as they interact together. Um, the next step is the analysis of data. So this part uh, has has had some uh, some love and, and attention in the last uh, some very good love. six months. Yeah. <laughs> so what we've introduced here is that we, we have the analysis here on the left. We have the tabular data. This is position data for worms one and two. And then in the lower right, we have this graphical display. So each of these um, different analyses, uh, most of them have a sort of a graphical counterpart. So you can actually see the data. Uh, in this case, we are seeing the, the two worm tracks. And uh, what you can do with this graph, um, you can change the formatting. And you can, uh, of course, you can um, modify uh, the title you want. You can change uh, colors of fonts. Um, you can change this, the size of these fonts. This is really for preparing data if you want for publication. Um, you can turn off the ticks on the axes. Uh, you can change the label fonts and so on, the label color. The other thing you can do too is you can 
you can uh, zoom in, you can pan around, you can uh, click on the tracks and you can change their color. You can, for instance, make them a dashed line. You can make them thicker, uh, such as that, and change their color, as I mentioned before. And then finally, what you can do is you can, uh, you can save the data in a, in a couple of different ways. Um, one way is that uh, you can copy this plot. If I click this button, it'll copy it. And then if I bring up something like Microsoft Word, uh, let me bring that in here, then I can just click and paste the plot in, which is what you've seen here. Now, we also have to offer an option um, to save to PDF. That's under here. Uh, if you click this button, it'll save to a PDF file. And, and what's nice about PDF is um, the data, the graph is saved in a vector format, so you can rescale this uh, larger or smaller to fit in your publications. So there's a couple of things that we've introduced here. Um, I'll walk through some of these um, these analyses now and show you uh, what we do with the graphing side of it. Also, if you click on these columns here, uh, it'll display the appropriate or the corresponding track in the graphic display. Um, if I move down, let me just show you quickly. These are a couple of new analyses. There's a bending point analysis. It's, I'll click here. Uh, let's say this one here. Um, what we've done here is uh, we're taking, uh, in this case, in the graph on top, I'm sorry, the table on top, there's 17 sample points. And you can change um, the number of sample points. Our geometric model for the worm is stored as a spline basis. So it's a mathematical curve that describes the center line and also the, the width profile of the worm. So you can resample that to as many points as you want. For instance, you might say, instead, I want uh, seven points. If I do that, you see I have seven sample points up here. Now, if you skip up to the center point display, here's the center point of the worm. Now you're seeing the graphical uh, display of the worm center line. And, and if I change this to seven points, then um, it immediately changes uh, the display and it changes the number of sample points. So let's, let's bring that one back to 17. And another thing that we've added, which is, is very helpful, is that when you move through the data table, and let's say you move down here and you go to frame 60, then you'll notice, oh, there we are, that the video uh, also jumps to frame 60. So here you can see that we're, we're sort of this worm, we're tracking this worm, this is its center point size, and I can jump uh, throughout the video this way. And conversely, uh, if I move through the video this way, you'll see that it's also changing where I am in the graph and the display. So we've synchronized all that up together to make it a little easier for you to look at your data. Okay, we're gonna, um, we're gonna move on to swimming worms and I'll come back and show you some more analyses. Uh, and then I'm going to pause for questions after I go through um, these multiple demonstrations. I see that the line of the questions uh, is, is starting to uh, accumulate. So we'll go through a couple of the questions. So now what um, I want to do is show you the swimming worm. If you go to Worm Lab, you have Worm Lab 3. We have a new thing on the help menu called Tutorials. And if you click on that, okay, it'll open up uh, a folder. Uh, that's been installed uh, with your software, either on the Mac or on the PC, and you'll see there's a video folder here. And one level up, by the way, there's all these PDFs um, that kind of help you walk through the software. This one for the first time, a quick tutorial, and then this one here will actually help you replicate this, this swimming tutorial if you haven't tried it. Um, so here I'm going to load uh, the swimming uh, AVI file here. And I'm just gonna I'm gonna run this a little bit so um, folks can see what's going on. So we have a, a single worm here, and this is in a uh, a drop of water, and you can see that the worm is sort of thrashing back and forth. Now, what's important to note here is you, you'll notice as the worm moves is that the midpoint is actually moving laterally. So we have this C shape, and then it changes to an inverted C shape, and back and forth. So it's oscillating. Now our existing model for crawling um, was relying on, well, I don't say relying on, but, but had sort of a preference for peristaltic progression modeling, which is it would move the model worm in such a way from frame to frame to try and fit the change in, in the worm's conformation. In this case, we're actually moving it more in a swimming-like manner. So even if the worm exhibits um, some type of aberrant uh, motion, we can still track it it's just faster if we start with what we'll call sort of the expecting model or the expectant model. So let me, let me go back to the first frame here. 
and we'll sort of do our the same thing we did before. We'll sort of set our scale. And then we'll adjust our image. Now um, I can turn on this correction and get something like this. Right. And now what we'll do is we will go to detect and track. And things are a little bit different. Um, I think we can turn that off. We have to click swimming mode here. And we do not need to do backtracking because we only have one worm. And it doesn't self-overlap and it doesn't interact with any other worms. So now we'll start the tracking. And you can see that it's actually tracking uh, quite a bit faster than um, than the uh, the original frame rate. Now I'm going to stop this real quick, and you can see that I'm not capturing sort of the entire length of the worm here. And if you go back to adjust the image, you can see that the threshold value is not capturing this because it's too faint. The threshold value is is too low. So let me go back uh, to my adjust image, and I'll just I'll bump this up a little bit. There we go. Oh, that might be a bit high. And then go back to detect and track. So you can kind of switch back and forth here. And now I can restart this. Oh, stop. Did that go so fast that we didn't even catch it? Hold on a second. OK, let me look at the adjustment. That should be fine. Detect and track. OK, start. There we go. So here, I'll stop this here, and then what I want to show you in the analysis of the data here is if we look at the bending angle of this, all right? We're looking at the midpoint bending angle. So that's the distance from the head to the midpoint and then the midpoint to the tail. If you take two lines and you look at the bending angle between those lines, if the worm is perfectly straight, then the bending angle is zero. So we see this oscillation as it moves from sort of a positive to a negative bending angle. And that's what this graph is showing here. Now, what you can take from this is you can use this graph or you can click this new tab here. We have this report tab. And if you look at that, what we're showing here is that um, we're giving you a list of the positive turns. There, These are the amplitudes of, taken from the graph and the starting and ending frames and the duration. And it's also for the negative turns. And then finally, the total number of turns that you're getting. So you have 51 terms in this section of the video. And you'll see down here in the lower left that I decided that on my turn report, I wanted to count turns that had at least a 20 degree amplitude in one direction and then lasted for at least five frames. So that's what you see here. If you uh, change this value, you can just refresh the data and it'll recompute this analysis for you. Um, the last part here is autocorrelation. And what autocorrelation does, it's used to determine the frequency of the waveform. So if you take this, uh, this sample of the bending angle, and you take that waveform and you slide it past itself, and you measure the peak points of correlation, and then look at the mean distance between there, you compute the autocorrelation. So in this case, we have a frequency of about um, 1.5 hertz, and we have a period, which is the inverse of that, of 0.65 seconds. Now let me jump back to sort of the, the position. Uh, which you saw first. If you if you look at this here, we'll we'll change this color back to just plain old solid blue line. If if you look at uh, let me see, oh, I didn't get that right. Okay. If you look at this, you'll notice you can't use this data. Um, you can use it for the bending angle analysis, but if you try to use this data to get the total track length, you have a problem because the researcher has been moving. The worm plate, you'll see that's what this long line is. So while the video was moving, it would continue to move the worm plate. So what we're trying to show you here is that even though that plate is moving, we're still capturing the, the body shape and the bending of the worm. So you can do this and, and, and move the worm as you go. And then I have um, I have one more thing that I wanted to show. Well, I, I would just like to acknowledge that this particular video is oh, yeah. from uh, the Jihong Bai Lab at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. And uh, the analysis, which Jeff was just showing us, the bending analysis, is actually a, a direct result of uh, collaboration and feedback from a researcher in South America uh, who needed this type of analysis. We, we had actually worked with them uh, and put together something in uh, MATLAB, uh, but they really wanted a more integrated solution. And uh, we worked with them and we came up with this uh, built-in graphical analysis uh, of the bending 
angle and uh, this this is an, an example of what we encourage from our worm lab users essentially give us your feedback because we're always looking to enhance the product so that, that's um you know an interesting point because when you mentioned the bi lab um you know they they came out with they, they had some other worms that they wanted to track and um but when they showed us this one and and we looked at it with the original worm lab under 2.0 you know, they, they left something to be desired. And so that's how the whole swimming model came about is mm -hmm. by, by having researchers contact us and say, hey, I really want to do this. And then what we do is we, we modify the software and then we usually have a back and forth where we show them results. And then once they're acceptable, then we roll them uh, into the product. So mm -hmm. we have a couple of labs that we're working with right now on, on new features for, um, you know, the upcoming Worm Lab 4.0. All right, so on to this, um, this last... Uh, this last example. So one of the things we want to show you was the omega bend analysis that we're doing. Um, that's uh, that's improved as well. So I'm going to load uh, a video, which we affectionately call the bending worm. And um, what's interesting about this video is this worm actually it moves backwards the whole time. Um, so <laughs> I'm not sure what's wrong with the worm, but uh, <laughs> it goes through all of these omega bends. So for us, it was a sort of a challenge to say, can we can we model this and capture this? So this this is what what's happening here during an omega bend is we have a lot of this self-touching or overlap, and um, we have a, a, a brand new uh, a new paper that will be coming out uh, in the next couple of months that that shows the um, the analysis that we do with self overlap. So when worms are coiling or overlapping themselves. Uh, we show like, you know, how are we tracking that? What algorithms are we using? Uh, and so forth. So for, for people that are interested in that, watch out for the paper. Um, here, I'll just play this real quick. You'll see that it's sort of sliding backwards through these, um, these omega bends. And so we're going to go ahead and uh, model that. So let's, uh, let's start. Uh, where are we here? Okay. Um, first, I'm going to adjust the image. Right, this is this not the first frame, right? Here is the first frame. Uh, we need a little bit more. Now, when you get to this level of threshold, you may have to use the fill holes. Um, it's something of a value of like three or four. Seems to work pretty good. Um, we go to detect and track. Um, you can keep width fitting on or off. It's a little faster if you if you turn it off. If you're really interested in the exact width or the body uh, surface area of the, the, the 2D profile of the worm, then I would leave that on. Um, we will use backtracking. Uh, let me click on this worm first. So w what I'm doing is when I click on the worm is I'm running a detection immediately. And what that does, if you go to the detection tab, is it sets this filter here. And this is a size filter. So it's now going to find, if there are multiple worms, other worms in the field of view that sort of match that size. So you don't have to enter all these values in. You just sort of click by example. Um, OK, I'm just uh, looking. I think that's all I need to do. And we'll start it up, and we'll see what happens. We have backtracking on. And let's see what happens. OK, so if you look at this, so what, what's going on here? Um, I make this into a bit of a tutorial as well. You'll see that it's tracking well, right? Until we get to something like this, and then there's a lag. So if you go back to this detection tab and you look at the number of iterations, okay, the value is too low. So the way this works is we start out with a model, we detect the worm, and then from frame to frame, what we're doing is we're we're changing the model to fit the underlying image. Now that's an iterative process, and if there aren't enough iterations available, well, you'll go faster, but you may not fit the worm. So if you're running Worm Lab and you're finding the fit's not that good, particularly during interactions and overlap, then you need to increase this value. So let's just double this and go back to the beginning. Uh, you don't need to delete the worms or anything. You can just run retrack here, track, and then start again. And see now. It's doing a better job. And you can increase those. I mean, you can run three, 400 iterations if you want. If it doesn't need the iterations, it won't use them. Um, so here, so here's an example. I just ran part of this video here. If I skip over to analyze, there you see this, this kind of 
interesting track that it's run. Uh, you know, you can look at the speed of the worm here. Um, the speed is usually quite noisy, so you probably want to look at smooth speed, where we where we get rid of uh, outliers that, that can be due to um, video noise of the mid, you know the positioning of the midpoint. Um, and then finally, if I go down here to omega bend, this chart shows me when it's detecting an omega bend. And so it's really looking at this bending angle and deciding when the bending angle exceeds a certain amount. So the head and tail are coming close together and there's a large bending angle. So if you, you have the omega bend here, this, this chart shows three omega bends and, and you're seeing that in the report here, which you can copy and paste into Word. So we tried to show you there's some, some different approaches. You know, you can, you can track worms um, at very low resolution um, in whole plate track. And I, I see that somebody had a question about, uh, you know, can, how many worms can you track on a whole plate? Can you track all of them? Uh, you know, we find you can do about 40 to 60 worms. And the way whole plate tracking works is that if the worms, because we have a large area image to track and the worms are very low resolution, when the worms collide, they touch or interact, we stop tracking them. There isn't enough video resolution to adequately determine what the overlap is. So you can do this from a single worm that, that's quite up close to doing um, sort of the whole plate and you know trying to go toward a, a more of a high throughput. Um, so that's it for the bending worm. For those of you that are interested in, in whole plate, uh, we have captured some videos and have some worm lab projects and, and we can share those with you. So you should contact us um, after the webinar and then we can show you how to do that. And we'll provide Absolutely. you with videos where you can try it yourself. So that, let me just close down uh, Worm Lab here. All right, so we wanted to uh, just recap some of the uh, advantages of Worm Lab. Uh, as you can see, we've just gone over some uh, tracking of uh, coiled or uh, entangled worms, actually, in our first uh, video. Uh, we're able to analyze these complex locomotory behaviors, such as the reversals and, uh, and omega bends. Other trackers have difficulties with those types of uh, entanglements and body conformations. So this is really uh, a, a unique feature to Worm Lab itself. Um, we've gone over the entire uh, solution itself the entire turnkey solution, which includes uh, from start to finish, namely the video capture aspect uh, combined with the simple to use uh, intuitive software. Uh, so essentially you could start co collecting high quality data immediately and reach your research goals in a more efficient manner. You know, one of the things I spoke to you about before was the versatility uh, of Worm Lab. The idea is to provide our, our customers with a system, you know, with the video uh, capture solution system, hardware and software together, or, or just software if, if that's what they need, um, and really show that, you know, we've designed a system that can capture worms at multiple magnifications with self-overlap, with interacting. Um, we have a question um, that said, uh, you know, what's the limit uh, for the number of worms interacting that you can reliably track? And they do this... Uh, uh, webinar participant um, deals with worms that clump at the edges of the bacterial food source. So um, I'm going to uh, just kick open Worm Lab here for a second and I will show you. I'll give you an idea of what does not work. <laughs> um, just let me see if I can find that here. Uh, one second. Yeah, so um, this doesn't work. Right, because if you look at something like this, and a pretty good rule of thumb is, if you can't tell what's going on in the video, in other words, the you know a reasonably um, uh, intelligent human user says, well, you know, I can see that there's multiple worms overlapping, but I can't resolve that. Um, and uh, I, I think that this is an example where you know food is, you know, worms are collecting at the edge. So I. I to more precisely answer this question, when two worms interact, we can track that. When three worms interact, it does become difficult. And beyond that, when they clump, um, you will lose the tracking at that point. But you really have to set up your, your plates and, and your experiments so that, yes, you can have some interactions, but that you're not trying to track, you know, worms out of, you know, you know in, in the thousands or, or in the high hundreds. So, um, you can still take these dishes and select a few worms and track those, uh, you know, that are not involved in the clumping. Um, 
you know, we, we mentioned here um, fully supported and documented. What we're really talking about when we talk about fully supported is your ability to contact MBF and present a special problem that you have and ask us if we can work with you. And, uh, you know, we realize that there are other um, options available for tracking worms, but we think that combined with our expertise uh, on the computer side, um, you know, we have neuroscience on, uh, scientists on staff, um, we, we understand uh, this tracking problem very well. Um, we think that we, we can deliver some real value here. Uh, the, the system is fully documented and it's kept up to date. So. Um, these are all things that, that we offer our customers. And then finally, the, it's PC and Mac compatible. Um, it runs on Windows 7. Uh, it runs on uh, Mac OS 10. It runs on the new version of Mac OS 10 Mavericks that uh, came out and is now free. Uh, and it runs on Windows 8 and 8.1. So we have um, some more questions coming up, which we're going to get to. Um, but I think what I want to mention first, for those of you who've been watching, if you want a free trial of Worm Lab. There's a two-week trial that you can access. You just have to Google Worm Lab trial. Worm Lab is one word. And that'll bring you to the page uh, that when you click on it, it'll bring you to this, this what you see on the screen here. The other thing is just to go to uh, www.mbfbioscience.com. Uh, if you do slash Worm Lab on the end of that, it'll bring you to the Worm Lab page. So the the software uh, is fully functional during the trial and includes some of these uh, video tutorials that you can work through. We'd also like to uh, thank all our Worm Lab users and beta test sites, test sites for their excellent feedback. Uh, we, videos and worms have been provided by uh, Dr. Randy Blakely at the Vanderbilt University, Dr. Ji Hong Bai at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. And the bending worm was supplied by Dr. Christoph Schmitz at the Ludwig <laughs> Maximilian University of Munich. Uh, we'd also uh, appreciate the assistance of NIH in our research activities. And we look forward to your feedback uh, as we continue to develop Worm Lab uh, over the next few years. Yeah, I just want to add one thing at the end there with it, with the NIH. Uh, it says Small Business Innovation Research Grant. So um, the development of Worm Lab was made possible by the SBIR program and the National Institutes of Environmental Health and Safety. They were very supportive and they were very excited, uh, you know, to have this kind of software brought to the research community, um, something that might not have been possible um, without their support. We are going to stay here um, to answer questions. And um, if you like, I'm, I'm going to go through these. So we'll hang around for a while. It's about 10 minutes to 1. Um, we appreciate um, your attending the webinar. And we do plan to do um, additional webinars in the future. So send us your feedback. Tell us what you liked and, and uh, what you didn't like and, and what you'd like to see more of. All right. Thanks once again for joining us. Um, we enjoyed it. And uh, send us your feedback. And again, um, Look for the Worm Lab trial. Thank you very much for joining us. Right. Bye now.